we only have one movie this week. And probably next week. It's a good possibility, Actually, but no. No, no, we don't. I forgot about Room. Yeah, we're watching uh, Room tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, so, regardless of that, we have one movie this week, and that movie is Krampus. Um, so, yeah, before we go into anything, um, apparently this movie kind of isn't what people thought it was going to be a while back. Like, when the first trailers came out. Because it was... I, I'm not qu I'm not quite sure what people were expecting, but apparently something relatively hardcore, especially if you've kind of seen like you know the images of Krampus and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right on. Um, but um, word got out pretty quick once this received its PG-13 rating, and that's when everybody kind of came out to its defense real fast and said we're not looking for like a gore kind of thing or like a real like monster movie type thing. Um, it, they're, they were looking for something closer to Gremlins and Poltergeist, is what they said. Okay. So, um, that's, it, it leaves a lot to live up to, so I don't know exactly how wise that was, but, um, let's just go in and see how well they did. Um, well, first, first off, I do like the, um, I know it seems simple and kind of not really anything that original per se but i did like the uh, the icy logos for universal and legendary that was awesome yeah and it was it fit too yeah um so yeah this is one of those movies where i'm not sure um well no, i i had heard people say this uh when like the early reviews came out but i don't re after seeing the movie i don't really see it but supposedly um some people might have pro like might have their patience tested a little bit because of how this kind of unravels itself um, and that it kind of takes a while. I can see some people thinking that, but I understand where you're coming from, too. But I didn't re I was expect- when I heard that, um, I was expecting to, it to take longer than it did. I agree. So, um, yeah, the- the- the whole beginning I thought was paced just fine. I didn't really- I, I love like, the first scene, too. I feel like it got there at pretty much the right time, yeah. Um, that's the thing about it, is even- even with the title- like, there's an there's a whole opening credit sequence, right? Um, with the title and everything. Um, but even even with that as it is, um, uh, I would have never thought that this was a horror movie until the horror stuff starts to happen. If I didn't know, right? Because usually, even even when there's like a lot of build up and then like your movie suddenly turns into a horror movie when it's one of those, still that build up has like hints in there that you know are horror related or make you remember you're watching a horror movie there's like none of that no like even like i said even when the title is like all the names and stuff like that are in like you know christmas card font yeah but even when the title is revealed it's not really in like a horror -y way or in a horror -y font or anything <laughs> it feels like a normal christmas movie yeah if you didn't know like, any better. And it's like, when you watch, like, the first half hour, you're just kind of watching it, and you're like, if you know what, even if you know what Krampus is, you're like, is the movie called Krampus? Because it's, like, a metaphor for something? Because <laughs> um, there's no hint whatsoever it's a horror movie until it's a horror movie. Right. <laughs> that, that's a good so, way to put it, too, honestly. Um, and there's a lot of, um, it's kind of... It's it's actually quite helpful. Like normally, I'd probably say this is kind of an obvious exposition thing. Uh -huh. um, but when we're getting to know the characters through all this, obviously most of the characters have really big personalities or something going on. It's basically the scene in Christmas Vacation when Eddie shows up. That's basically what the entire first half hour of the movie is, <laughs> um, with uh, David Koechner kind of being our. Um, our Eddie character in a way. Not really, but I'm just kind of in this kind of... In this way, he's trying to be. Yeah, you get what I mean. Um, I like the Jingle All the Way stuff at the beginning. Cause that's that's the vibe I was getting, but like a more extreme version of it. Yeah, what's interesting... Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, the thing is, is um, our... We also have a really good cast in this. Yeah. With our, our main couple being um, the parents who are Adam Scott and Tony Collette. I'm not typically... I mean, he's never really done anything wrong to me, but <laughs> I've just never kind of really been much of an Adam Scott fan. Yeah. Um, but he's really good here. Yeah. And, of course, Tony Collette is like, you know, has she ever done anything wrong? Ever. 
um, performance wise. She she's got some craft athletic movies out there, but I mean her herself, right? I don't believe ever. Um, so and then we have the other couple who are David Heckner and Allison Tolman, um, who apparently is most famous for being on Fargo, but. I think she was, um, she might have been in The Gift. Was she the, yes, I think she was. Okay. I didn't want to get that wrong because I, <laughs> there's a lot of, yeah. So, and then we have, um, all the children. Now this is a case where we have them in the house and there are a lot of kids. Oh yeah. There's like, um, what, three on Hegner's side and then two on their side. Um, so that kind of leaves open for that one annoying child character. No, there's four on character set. I forgot the silent kid. The mm -hmm. kid that never says anything. Um, <laughs> so uh, she was born without a tongue, Cork. <laughs> yeah, pretty so, much. So, um... That was uh, not on purpose. <laughs> but the annoying character... I mean, there are there are unlikable kid characters in this movie, but there's not the annoying one. Because the kid that plays, like, the main kid, um, Scott and Paulette's son, is really good. Like, a really good actor. Yeah. Um... And it's very easy to kind of accept him as kind of our, I guess you could say he's our protagonist. Once the action kind of goes down, he kind of has to take a sideline because it's the adults that are fighting them off. But still, um, he's kind of really good as like a central character. Um, okay, as far as um, how they handle um, the title character... Um, I'm a little conflicted because the scene where we first see him is really good. <laughs> oh yeah. I love the way that scene is shot when she's out in the blizzard by herself and just the whole atmosphere of that and then how it just goes dark like immediately when he's around and then she sees him jumping off the rooftops and then we see just little bits and pieces of him as she he's slowly revealed to her through the fog of the blizzard. Um, but the thing about that is, um, we, um, you, I just got distracted. It's the kid from Chef. Oh. I thought he yeah. looked familiar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That makes sense now. Um, so, the thing about it is, we are kind of reveal, it's very, very vague, but he's still pretty much revealed to us in this scene. Right. Um, and it's a really, really great scene. But at the same time, when that scene came afterwards, when uh, Adam Scott and Peckner were searching the uh, ransacked house, and they were kind of putting clues together as to what did this, and like, you know, the where the fireplace is is completely torn out, and everything is just kind of strewn around everywhere, and there's the giant hoof prints in the snow. Um, and they're trying to figure out and put together what in God's name did this, I kind of felt like that scene needed to be before we actually saw him. I agree. Because it would have been a really kind of eerie build up to him to where we're not quite sure. We're along with them not quite sure what they're dealing with and these clues would just kind of really set a tone of unease about what in God's name it looks like or any other thing about it. Um... So I thought, I thought that kind of would have been a bit more of a, maybe a more ceremonious way to introduce him. Um, but I have no problems with the actual scene that we see him for the first time, so there's that. He's still kind of, he's still built up to, because we don't actually get up close and personal to him until like the very end. But His face looks way, very different than I was expecting to. But the way he's just kind of, we see him, but we don't really see him. Because there's just because every time we see him, he's outside and everything is there's just this constant fog and vagueness with the blizzard and what it's done. So yeah, that's fine. I love the animation sequence too. Yeah, I was that was done that. really well. Um, there is an animated sequence right in the middle of this um, that's really good, where it's um, we're kind of getting the backstory of it. It's kind of like the Deathly Hallows scene, um, but it's kind of like. Um, what, would that be stop motion, I guess? Or, that could have also been computers. It's one of those ones where it's hard to tell, but it could have been one or the other of those. <laughs> There's CG um, stuff, but not as much, apparently. Um, because we have the little girl, and she looks normal, and then everything else, every other person in it is like a silhouette that moves differently. Um, and I also like the way, with the way, the little detail where the way she's animated, she's, 
she basically looks like an animated girl but to where like her ears stick out so you can see the features of her and everything. So there's the moment when her house is getting attacked and she kind of covers her ears while it's happening. But because of the way she's animated and her head is situated, she can't cover her ears like this. She actually covers them like this. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a nice little detail. Um, and it, yeah, in that animated sequence, we get a little... Um, I suppose it's a bit obvious, but still, it's a nice way to how they don't necessarily blatantly go into it about how... Um, what's what they the dialogue in the animated sequence kind of is a callback to uh what we saw in the opening credit sequence which is the whole um people going on insane shopping sprees and toppling over each other and kids getting black eyes and people beating the shit out of each other for toys and all that i'm pretty sure that guy off the ladder is um, dead <laughs> he took a heck of a bump <clears throat> now of course when you're going with this whole gremlins-esque tone um, to the point that even when, like, um, when we hear the to like, the, there's the toys that are, like, the helpers of Grampus that are, like, demonic, um, when we don't see them but we hear them, that's, I'm pretty sure, like, the exact gremlin sound effects. I'm not positive, like, I can't prove that, but <laughs> it's, it's really, really close. Um... And this is one of those movies to where I could do, I could do like I did with The Good Dinosaur and went through all the Lion King stuff. Um, but this is one of those movies where you can kind of point out that stuff. Like, it's very much like Gremlins in a lot of ways. Right. It's up to the point that they manifest themselves in the attic, even. Um, but this one is so clearly an homage as opposed to just totally just stealing. Um, that it's, it's kind of, it's difficult to look at it that way. It's pretty easy to see it as... This is just kind of, um, we love those movies, so we kind of just kind of took their tone a little bit. Yeah, I can I see that. I everywhere when I said that. I apologize. Um, and so with that tone, um, there's the whole finding the line between funny and scary. Um, yeah, there are some really creepy scenes in this movie. Um, and so, like, the, the, the first reveal of the Jack in the Box is a really creepy moment. Um, but then there's also the stuff like, um, when the gingerbread man comes to life for the first time, <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of, it was so unexpected. My response was to laugh kind of loudly to the point that I kind of like, I hope nobody heard me here. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was funny. Um, sorry. <laughs> so yeah. And you know, I, I believe that's supposed to be the whole, it is. David Koechner being attacked by um, a bunch of gingerbread men with a nail gun, I'm pretty sure is supposed to be funny. I, there's no way that they could go into that thinking otherwise. Um, but then there's also the stuff, like when you, you have the gingerbread men, which are funny, but then you have the Jack in the Box or the fucking doll with the wings. Um, just the kind of choices they made there, you could tell they're kind of going, um, here's some funny stuff and here's some, we were going for more legitimately creepy. Um, and it's it's a nice little mesh because they go back and forth kind of in a in an equally balanced way, and but and it's not afraid to go to dark places either. No, it's like it's not, not like um, like like with Poltergeist and Gremlins, it's the whole. Obviously, they're not R-rated movies, but you know that they're going to be lighter. But at the same time, they still go to some really dark places, like the um, just the the whole face ripping off and Poltergeist not even withstanding. That's just, I'm really not sure how the movie got PG with that, even in the 80s. But it is what it is. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot, there's a lot of talk about um, it pretty much becoming an instant classic, um, which I can see. I'm not, I would say, I don't know. With the way audiences are now, it's kind of hard to uh, distinguish who would think it's... Who goes to see it knowing what it is and kind of appreciate and have fun with it. Um, but there's also going to be people probably expecting a full-on horror movie that are going to talk about how stupid they think it is. But most of his fan base know what to expect. So. Yeah, it's the Trick or Treat guy. Yeah, it's my but Trick or Treat was a very R-rated movie, though. And it's this is kind of... If you're wondering like which like tone we're getting it's a lot like um the last segment of the movie with brian cox and the the doll slash kid slash thing sam um the that it's more in the tone with that story uh as opposed to the other two 
But, um... And there's a nod to Charlie Brown in this for the uh, fans, too. I don't know. There's, like, three or four stories in Trigger 3. I don't know. It's been a little while, but, yeah. If you're looking for which tone it is from Trigger 3, it's definitely that, um... That last... The last segment of the movie. Uh... So... Yeah, I was, uh, quite pleased with this. This is good. And I wasn't... Yeah, I really... I really had no idea what, what, I, was, what I was gonna think, yeah. Um... Because I wasn't, like, really that hyped for it. Even, even The Gremlins comparisons got me a little more... Actually, a lot more interested than I um, would have been. Right on. Um, but, yeah. And they do... Um, another thing I really liked is um, they actually don't do the jump scares. No. Like, there are a couple in there. And it's kind of like, yeah, things, like, pop out unexpectedly. But not really, there's no real traditional jump scare. Like, the only, like there's one scene where the doll with the wings kind of comes from out of nowhere, and when they first hear Krampus uh, jump on the roof, those are kind of jump scares, but they're not really presented in a way that's they feel cheap or anything. So, um, yeah, this was a lot of fun. And you can see, like, you... With the with like with the way things are going lately, um, when you hear somebody talking about a movie and they say the word fun, um, the internet age of criticism has made the word fun sound so condescending. Right. And I don't mean it that way. Like you will actually have a lot of fun watching this movie, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, it's like with Victor Frankenstein last if week. If you're able to, yeah, I'm pretty sure people like this a lot more. I've already, I've a few people now. I've had to jump on Victor Frankenstein's defense. Yeah, but um, I think if people go into this knowing uh, like what it's like, um, I think they'll be fine. But I can see this. I can also see it's it having its detractors for people going in thinking it's like a full on horror movie, and they don't, they're not going to get that. I think the gingerbread men are going to lose some people if they're looking for full-on horror. <laughs> but, um, but it's all in good fun, so that's the point. So, yes. I've got a little bit to say. Uh, yeah, I know. You, you knew it was coming. Um, there's a lot of uh, people talking about this coming to Halloween Horror Nights this coming year. And whether it's coming to 26 in Orlando or it's coming to 2016 in Hollywood... There are several aspects I can honestly see into a house. There are several jump scare moments that I thought would work. Not traditional jump scares, but things that would work in a haunted house aspect. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to have to take a lot of liberties with this. Kind of like uh, with Crimson Peak. They took a lot of liberties with Crimson Peak, but the story was somewhat still there. There's a lot of things I can honestly see them doing. I think if you're going to look for more of Halloween Horror Nights, I think they're probably going to stick with The Dark Christmas and maybe have like Michael Daughtry... Like, bring Krampus into it. That's just my opinion, though. Uh, as for a star amount, AJ? Three. Okay. That's what we've got for this week's edition of AJ's Movie Reviews. Tomorrow, i got a surprise for you. we got a second one. Mm -hmm. Second edition of AJ's Movie Reviews. And uh, we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about 14 movies that may or may not do something during the award season. Mm. The Spirit Award nomination is already out. I think that pretty much covers them. Right on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Spirit Awards. Hello. So, uh, that's coming up tomorrow and Sunday. Brand new verses. Your cryptic comment. Happy Horror Days. And, of course, speaking with the Halloween Horror Nights mantra, 7 o'clock, Sunday night, the final Halloween Horror Nights 25 podcast with all your favorites on pop. That's coming at you. So, uh, stay tuned for that. If you'd like to follow our brand new Twitter feed, it is at Popcast Network. Tweet me at at Soro and Disney, and as always, if you have anything to say to AJ, just shoot it my way, and I'll make sure he gets the information. So AJ, we got next week uh, Room and In the Heart of the Sea, and potentially something else. You never know. I guess we'll find out. Rumor has it. We'll see what happens. So uh, that being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, any parting words? 